I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Quay, Madam Speaker, Mada Olivan, Delousey, Lisa Lachance, Dunlewe, Chibuktuk, Mi'kma'ki. Madam Speaker, I start today in, in Mi'kmaq as part of my acknowledgement and gratitude for rising today on traditional and unceded territory of Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. I'd like to start by offering congratulations to our leader, the leader of the official opposition, the Premier, and all new and returning members of the House. I already appreciate the support, camaraderie, and patience that we have offered to each other as we get started. I plan today to talk about my community of Halifax, Little Sable Island, as it is now, in a period of dynamic change and growth. Je m'aimerais aussi partager des histoires de nos citoyens que je utilise en tant que fondation pour mon travail et ma vie. Je vais continuer en anglais, mais j'ai hâte pour avoir le, le, les occasions pour m'exprimer en français. So just quickly, <laughs> I, 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 I will share stories of Nova Scotians today, the stories that build the foundation for me. And I'm going to continue in English, don't worry. Um, but I would also like to say that I'm very excited to have a, a, opportunities to communicate in French in the house. We all come here carrying the stories of our constituents and our communities. We know and share the what, and we ask together, now what? I also want to highlight areas of work where I think we need to undertake collective action to make positive change. As so many members have noted, we don't get here alone. I am thankful to my family, of course, for their support. My wife, Heather, who isn't surprised anymore when I come up with a project, even this one. <laughs> I, I thank my two children, Jason, who is 18, put in many kilometers and many hours of canvassing. Mm -hmm. My daughter, Kira, who at 15 found the idea of door-to-door -door canvassing cringy, kept a keen eye on election social media, texting me updates such, such as, the liberal leader says he's going to do this. What's your party going to do about it? <laughs> the support of my broader family has been important, beginning with uncles, aunts, and cousins who surrounded me with love growing up. Perhaps the importance of family has been more keenly felt this past year as we mourned the sudden passing of my father-in-law, Dr. David Gass. I felt his love and support from day one. I had only just joined the family when he bought me this jacket I'm wearing over two decades ago when I couldn't afford what I needed for a job interview. He was so excited about my campaign. One of my last memories is him telling me I was amazing. What a remarkable gift to be so supportive of another person's dream. Halifax Citadel Sable Island has amazing volunteers, and we built a strong campaign. In particular, I would like to thank Peter Glenster, Nana Moore, Don Carney, Mabuba Rahman, Ada McNally, Will O'Connor, Robin Smith, Cameron Pye, and so many others for their tireless work on the campaign. I am honored to stand here today in a structure built to support good governance. I come to this role as part of a lifelong journey dedicated to making things right, to searching for justice for all. I graduated from high school in Canning and then came to the big city for university. After completing a Bachelor of Arts in International Development Studies at Dalhousie, I worked and backpacked around the, the world for a few years, but eventually I decided it was time to come home to Nova Scotia and come home to my mom. I then completed a Master's of Public Administration also at Dalhousie University. This field of study responded to my desire to understand how to organize and manage government in ways that not only responds to the needs of society, but enhances and moves forward our collective well-being. And if, if the other world premier was here, I would assure him that I do understand it, supply and demand in economics. Um, in fact, that my concentration in my, under, in my master's was economics. <laughs> I also met my wife while doing our master's together, so I can admit that sometimes I was a little bit distracted from my quest to understand how to build good public policy. My wife, Heather, and I were lucky to both land jobs with the federal government Just in Ottawa. Order. After Sorry, excuse me. Um, the member, honorable member from um, Citadel Sable Island should not refer to other members' presence in the House. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Continue. Um, I work with the Canadian International Development Agency. Oh, the on continue the honourable member <laughs> for Halifax, it'll save Thank you, Thank Madam you. Speaker. 
I worked for the Canadian International Development Agency and represented Canada around the world at UN and regional human rights bodies. Through a federal management development program, I learned with a diverse group of colleagues how to implement principles of accountability, transparency, innovation, integrated risk management, sound financial controls, and yes, economic policy. I also worked at the Privy Council Office focused on negotiations and other issues on behalf of the Prime Minister. Heather, Jason, Kira, and I returned to Halifax in 2008 when I joined the Nova Scotia Department of Finance. And I'd like to, to say to my former workmates across the street, every day I value what I learned about this province during that time. So I come to this role as MLA with a deep appreciation for the practice of good public policy and governance, a clear understanding of the challenges, an unwavering belief that we can always do better and that we need to constantly evaluate the outcome of our efforts address where we have fallen short of our objectives and build on success. My conviction in our ability to, to do good and do better is not naive. I have faith that all of us working together will make Nova Scotia a just and equitable home for generations to come. I also want to share some stories about uh, when government as a collective abandoned young people, families and communities. Mm -hmm. Stories about what, what, what we ask Nova Scotians do to just, to, just to survive. I will share stories that underscore what we miss when we allow inequality and injustice to persist. My constituency of Halifax Sable Island has ha not had a maiden speech since 2006, mm. so I will give an overview of where the community is now. Mm. Halifax Citadel Sable Island is the community where I've lived, worked, played, volunteered and studied for over 30 years. Prior to the electoral campaign, I thought that I knew this community well, I, that I knew it in all its diversity. I was unprepared for the intimacy of the, camp of the campaign. As you approach people in their homes and on the phone, often in the evening with the pressures of the day behind them, I'm honored by the trust that so many placed in me and my team, sharing their dreams and frustrations, and I carry their stories and trust with me. To describe the community, first, Halifax Siddle, Sable Island is an astoundingly beautiful community, bordered by the ocean on three sides. Nova Scotians and global visitors alike come to our community to enjoy unrivaled public spaces. We have the Halifax waterfront with unique spaces to play, fish, dock, enjoy a, me a meal or shop. The public gardens where the, be the beds change according to the season, inviting you to walk through often. Citadel Hill provides a piece of history from the early days of this colony, great sunset views and a challenge for runners and walkers. And Point Pleasant Park is an exceptional urban forest. We also have the Northwest Arm, home to rowers, sailors, paddlers, swimmers, and so much more. Spring Garden, I like to call it Nova Scotia's High Street, rises like a phoenix and will be back better than ever with restaurants, cafes, shopping, and small businesses such as the iconic Jennifer's of Nova Scotia. We also found a home for our constituency office on Spring Garden Road and look forward to watching the street come alive again. Mm -hmm. We have three universities headquartered in the riding, offering cultural, intellectual, and recreational opportunities for the, the entire community. Halifax Citadel is a diverse community by any measure. It is a time of rapid change in the riding as well. Every day on the campaign trail, I met people who had recently moved back to Nova Scotia, often exchanging lives in larger urban centres such as Toronto or Vancouver for the community where they grew up. I met many people who moved to Halifax because they wanted something different and found Halifax to be a perfect, uh, a perfect mix of opportunity and ocean. And I also met many international community members living in Halifax, Little Sable Island as permanent residents, on a work permit, or on student visas. Artists of all types are drawn to live and work in Halifax, Little Sable Island, and we of course have the IWK and the QE2 as trusted provincial institutions. This, this is also a community where people retire, attracted by cultural activities and hoping for accessible services. I will now turn to stories that matter, of people who have deeply affected me and contributed to the development of the key principles that guide my work and life. Firstly, I dedicate this address to the memory of my mother who passed away years ago. And the stories start with her. As a young person growing up in the 50s and 60s, mom struggled with undiagnosed learning disabilities and a legacy of poverty. Her story is intimately linked to mine, of course. I stood by her side as she faced the effects of prejudice and inequality. 
As a single parent in the 1970s, she was repeatedly den denied rental accommodations despite her dedication to and steady employment in nursing. In her later life, my mom struggled to access much needed services in Nova Scotia. Mental health stigma, limited services, domestic violence, and limited financial means all impacted, impacted her health. Mm -hmm. I watched as she was stigmatized as she sought help for mental illness. I stood with her as we arrived at the Chrysalis Health Transition Shelter for the first time. Mm -hmm. She lived in rural Nova Scotia, which may have affected how she could accept, uh, access services, but really there was no supported path to wellness and stability. It was largely just mom and I over the years, and despite this challenge, she instilled me an analytical mind and undefeatable joie de vivre. <laughs> Fast forward to my own life as a parent. My partner, Heather, and I had been in Ottawa and had two young children, and we realized we wanted to raise our children with grandparents and extended family. Slow down. Sorry. <laughs> we also knew that we needed support parenting our children. The story I need to tell you about our experience fighting for our family is not only mine to tell, both my children have overcome incredible hurdles and accomplished so much already. Mm -hmm. And I know that my words will become a permanent record today, so I take care with these words. Jason was a funny, communicative, communicative and loving child. He read independently on his own as a toddler and was assessed to be reading at university level in grade one. Mm -hmm. He always loved learning in school, and was but, but was also challenged to manage in a typical classroom. By grade three, he was on an endless rotation of school exclusion and school reintegration. We are struggling at home too. We spent an initial two years on the IWK wait list for services. Mm -hmm. We sought private support, but that only got us so far and got us nowhere in the IWK system. Mental health programs were not long enough. Progress seemed to be lost. We would stand by as our child expressed mental distress so severe that we needed to access, access help via 911 dozens of times, at school, at home, and in the community. We kept saying we need to do better for our child and begging government officials and health professionals to agree. We knew we had a loving son who needed support, yet we were not provided with services or funding that we needed. In the most harrowing moments, we were told additional services were only available if we relinquished our child into the care of the province. But he wasn't a child in need of care and protection. He was a child in need of medical treatment. So I cannot let the story end without telling you that Jason is an amazing young person mm -hmm. who contributes much to his family, schools and communities since those difficult times. When I have watched him achieve significant milestones, establishing a business, graduating from high school and starting post-secondary, I catch my breath thinking about what we would have missed, what we would all have mm -hmm. missed if we had not fought for him and our family. Mm -hmm. My daughter, Kira, has her own story. She has encountered anti-Indigenous racism at school. Her ADHD is often misunderstood. We've received constant school reports that state Kira would be more successful if she would just concentrate. These statements of the obvious reflect how little educators understand about this neurodevelopmental disorder. Along with managing Tourette's and dyslexia, she works twice as hard every day to overcome her learning disabilities. At the same time, she has retained her caring spirit for others sometimes arguing too loudly or too much on behalf of others she feels have been wronged, but also doing small, considered actions. She finds solace in artwork and under, uh, under the pressure as a competitive hockey goalie. And I spend lots of time in bed for South at the BMO Center, so I, I, I take advantage of all the new businesses. <laughs> Our family's story is just one of many. It is not an exaggeration to say that my partner or I are contacted on a weekly basis by parents or those supporting complex child and youth health issues and being left on their own to do it. If it was just one story, if I thought my story was really unique, the, what value would it be on sharing it? But what I know is that this happens every week mm -hmm. in Nova Scotia mm -hmm. where children, youth and families are, are put on the edge being told there's nothing for them. Mm -hmm. I shared with you a bit about my friend Adam Richardson yesterday. And when he was our neighbor, we also got to know his parents. And they confided in us about his struggles in school. As a child with autism, despite being academically gifted, he was overwhelmed by the classroom environment. His family undertook extraordinary efforts to support him. They were Adam's biggest supporters as he became passionate about scootering and snowboarding. 
They tried moving to a small town in Nova Scotia. They tried a private school. They used the media to plead for better services. Last spring, I became aware that Adam was back in Halifax in junior high and the circumstances that he faced. Adam was in the revolving door of school integration, alone during each and every day with an EPA in a small room. Outside school, we learned he faced incessant bullying. At this point, he had fallen through the cracks as so many formal services and also ones offered by community organizations. My daughter was excited that they would be at Citadel High together. Instead, in June of this year, we received the devastating news that Adam had died alone at the age of 14. Instead of celebrating his 15th birthday together on October 12th, my daughter Kira and I spent time at the Commons Skate Park where there's a large Adam Memorial. You can see it the next time you drive past. The stories go on. Stephen Kimber recently wrote in the Halifax Examiner about a child from Nova Scotia whose family needed help to support her. And to get that support, she was relinquished into the care of the province. Mm -hmm. But then Nova Scotia sent her to BC because we don't actually have some services to support her. Mm -hmm. When she became a parent back in Nova Scotia, there was actually a birth alert um, issued that resulted in the automatic removal of her own child. Perhaps these stories sound familiar. We have grappled with our, our failings towards young people before. In 2004, a youth who was waiting for services, whose plans for stability and progress had been missed and non, not implemented, and whose life was already full of, of uh, charges, ended in an accident that resulted in the death of Teresa M M Backwards, thank you. <laughs> the Nun Inquiry team spoke with hundreds of people across Nova Scotia. The report pieces together the young life of, a youth, of the youth in question, one characterized by a lack of access to appropriate services. We committed as a province to do better, mm -hmm. to make sure we support young people and their families and communities easily, early, and appropriately. That if a young person needs services, we will provide them in collaboration with others. And most importantly, that children and youth could access what they needed without ending up within, in the youth justice system or without needing to enter the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. I can tell you so many more stories. Some of young people like Adam that we lost in death and some that we continue to lose in life. We cannot, as a province, afford to step away from anyone and our families and young people in particular. We can no longer shy away from the complexity that those situations raise. I am not naive. I am well acquainted with government structure and organization. In the federal government, the PCO, and at the provincial department of finance, I often found bureaucratic escape and questions of jurisdictional and departmental responsibility. I wrote those notes that said, this issue is not my portfolio, but I will be pleased to pass this along to my colleague. Or I have taken the liberty of sharing your letter with the provincial government of um, any jurisdiction. Pushing issues towards the people who have the jurisdiction to address them is sometimes a legitimate step. But when we see the same problem time and time again without resolution, I believe that that should signal to us here in this legislature that this suggests a complex problem affecting Nova Scotians where we cannot step away and where solutions require collaboration and creativity. Mm -hmm. I think that we can all recognize that there are many issues before us that require our collective determination and collaboration. Housing was the number one issue on the doorstep in Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. The housing crisis affects residents at all different income levels. In 2006, then newly elected MLA Larry Pereira spoke about housing pressure facing single parents and students. Now it is a rare Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island resident who does not have concerns about housing. Even homeowners recognize that the, the decrease in housing security affects everyone's quality of life. Mm -hmm. Residents treasure living in a diverse neighborhood and know that doesn't happen by accident. Rather, there is a need to ensure each resident has access to what they need. On one of my first campaign phone calls, I spoke to a woman who lived in her own home on English Street. And when I asked what was on her mind, she talked about being so worried about people living rough in the winter. She was anxious for her neighbors. She knew that the tents and shelters represented a huge failure in our community. And throughout the campaign, thousands of people told me how they felt that this current situation was un is unacceptable. Residents who have been facing, as, as we heard stories earlier, uh, residents who have been renting also face precarity. 
On Brunswick Street, I spoke to a provincial civil servant who had been living in the same apartment for about 10 years. Two years prior, he watched as his building was sold, the rent was dramatically increased, and many of his neighbours left. Then he watched as services decreased, from cleaning up common areas six days a week to one day a week, and repair services outsourced. So that a call to the super for something that, that previously would have gotten fixed in an hour now takes waiting four or five days. He was at his last straw. One more rent increase and he needs to move, but he doesn't know where he could afford. In the meantime, he is documenting the garbage in the hallways, rodents and insects, and general dirtiness of the building, trying to make things better even if he's not able to stay. I've also been speaking to many residents who occupy a building near Point Pleasant Park um, who struggle with the same concerns. One resident had her post-surgical home care withdrawn because of the pests in the building. The housing combined boom and crisis is also changing who can buy homes in our neighborhood. A volunteer in my campaign is an elementary school teacher and he and his wife, who is also a professional, would like to buy a house in the neighborhood, but based on their salaries they cannot. Resent residents are despondent because they know their children and grandchildren can't afford to live nearby. Everyone has a, a right to safe and secure housing. Furthermore, we need to consider what kind of communities we want to have. After speaking with thousands of residents, I can attest to the concern and compassion and their ongoing desire to live in a diverse and vibrant neighborhood. Residents are also concerned about Nova Scotia's health system. Parents spoke about managing the immunization schedules of their babies and young children through walk-in clinics. These same folks in, in their role as children worry about access to health care for their aging parents. Agonizing waits for tests, diagnoses, and treatment that they know and that we must acknowledge affect the quality and length of their life. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, but perhaps more concerningly, I heard from dozens of medical professionals who live in the riding. Nurses, doctors, specialists, and other allied health care providers talked about their own fears. How they knew that they were waiting too long to get tests and diagnoses for their patients, especially when with issues when time matters, like cancer. Mm -hmm. Facing maximum capacity in hospitals, with people in hospital beds who need long-term care, and people suffering and repeatedly showing up in the ER who, who, who cannot be admitted. They also talked about leaving Nova Scotia because they felt, what, they felt that what they're asked to make do with in Nova Scotia does not match how they want to care for patients. People also spoke about, the spoke about the unacceptable wait for mental health care from children to seniors, and they also wanted to make sure we take action on providing good quality long-term care. There were a couple of other issues that, that voters framed as fundamental, that if we don't act and achieve progress on these issues, nothing, nothing else would work. They saw the challenge of reconciliation as intimately connected to how we move forward as a society. Voters also demanded integrated child climate change action across all areas. As mentioned before, this is the first main speech from the constitu constituency of Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island since 2006. Mm -hmm. In reviewing this past address, past address, I can say the old adage, plus ça change, plus ça reste la même, applies in this situation. One issue that was highlighted in 2006 and, we, and persists today is the question of infilling on the Northwest Arm. Mm -hmm. A long-term solution is needed. It's hard to say anything original to, uh, with regards to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the entire global community. It has been the challenge we all face. On the positive side, I truly believe that there are many heroes around the world who reacted quickly, used the best science available, and guided communities through the worst. In Nova Scotia, we saw some of the best of our culture. People coming together to help neighbors, Nova Scotians building community networks small and large, to provide connection, safe spaces, and ensure basic needs, needs were met. Mm -hmm. As the world changed rapidly, citizens were watching. In my past work, I have supported youth to mobilize to address various problems. They learned a lot as they watched the world shut down and then restart in sometimes unrecognizable ways. They watched, along with all of us, frequent updates from governments at all levels. What they have said to me, based on the experience, uh, can be summarized like this. Now we know. Now we know that government, when government wants to do something, it can turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. And so if nothing happens, we know government is making a decision not to act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was joined in my campaign by many volunteers, and I appreciate the contributions of every single one of them. I most recall my time on the doorstep with my son Jason and another young person. 
Jack Baker, a 17-year-old student at Citadel High School. Together on election day, I invited them to reflect on our shared experience, noting that we can never unknow what has been shared with us, and the question is what now? What will we do with this knowledge we have to make lives better? It was, it was disappointing that the government did not share their vision for advancing together as treaty people. Inequity persists. We have yet to elect a Mi'kmaq MLA in Nova Scotia. We have the roadmap from the Royal Commission, the TRC, and the inquiry into missing and worried Indigenous women. I encourage all of us to work to amplify the priorities of Inuit First Nations and Inuit communities in Nova Scotia. As a parent, I have sat in healing cir circles and participated in ceremony, and I can attest to the fact that people have shared the stories, and now the time is for action. I also wanted to see more in the speech from the throne on equity issues, in particular in the wake of a significant decision that articulated how Nova Scotia had failed disabled Nova Scotians in their right to housing. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, as a province, we have accessibility goals that need to be met between now and 2030. As you have learned through the speech, I am passionate about improving mental health care for all Nova Scotians. Sadly, I think the government is missing the mark in focusing on increasing access to private therapy. To start, as they have noted, we don't have en enough clinicians to meet demand. More fundamentally, providing traditional therapy, divorce from other services, in isolation from context, and in the typical approach that can only work for people with specific needs, not a high level of, of acuity. A therapy session every few weeks can be an important part of mental health, but for a very limited number of people with specific diagnoses. Mm -hmm. We need a functioning step care approach that, assure, that ensures folks get the right service at the right time at the right place. Mm -hmm. Sorry. We are seemingly isolated from important research, evaluation, and practical experience across Canada and globally that outlines key elements for positive mental health outcomes. These include systems built on principles of community integration, youth and family engagement, and peer support. I also want to know more about how the government will address substance use. In both mental health and substance use, we have a huge gap in Nova Scotia where an inpatient treatment in both is both in short term and in short supply, and there are no step-down services. So people have only started to stabilize when they are discharged to work with community mental health, which is not designed to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. The COVID-19 pandemic and associated public health measures have laid bare many issues of inequality. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 can be seen and felt within many communities already struggling due to various forms of systemic oppression, such as racism, colonization, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Mm -hmm. The 2S LGBTQ plus community already faced serious challenges related to employment, poverty, violence, bullying schools, homelessness, and mental health problems because of that pervasive homophobia, transphobia, and heteronormativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The COVID-19 pandemic has fur further reinforced existing social <coughs> inequities. Some jurisdictions are doing something about supporting their 2S LGBTQ plus communities. Earlier this year, the Yukon released its interdepartmental strategy to support the community, along with announcing policy change to provide the best gender-affirming care in Canada. Many cities such as Ottawa, such as Ottawa with, with almost the same population as Nova Scotia, also have plans that articulate how they will strengthen outcomes for 2S LGBTQ plus folks. I am the only 2S LGBTQ plus spokesperson identified amongst the caucuses. I invite all caucuses to consider if there are any members who would like to also act as a spokesperson. <laughs> I'm a big believer in going further together with understanding and shared mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do to enhance the outcomes of 2S LGBTQ plus Nova Scotians? Creating an inclusive and just context benefits, us all, be benefits all of us. When my wife, Heather, and I started our careers and families, we did not see a future for ourselves in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Employers did not recognize our relationship, mm -hmm. and we were forbidden from adopting children. Mm -hmm. We moved to Ottawa, where our employer treated us like any other couple, and where we were allowed to adopt. And we also became one of the first legally married couples in Canada under equal marriage. We continue to lose people to other places where they can be themselves. I can share the story of Rose, who grew up in Halifax, 
completed her first degree at King's College, and was a page in this legislature for two years, yet moved to Ottawa to transition. Mm -hmm. In health, our MSI coverage for gender-affirming care needs to be extended so that we can provide care at national and international standards. Mm -hmm. in, ed in education, we need to teach stories of diversity and achievement and ensure mental health and anti-bullying anti -bullying curricula pay appropriate attention to 2SLGBTQ plus young people. Mm -hmm. 2SLGBTQ plus seniors have long faced the prospect of going back into cl the closet as they enter long-term care. We need to support the good efforts of Northwood in supporting its residents so inclusive housing is available province-wide. 2SLGBTQ plus folks want to travel and need to see themselves reflected in tourism and cultural opportunities, mm -hmm. which, uh, which also helps people know they are safe. Language is ever evolving as we discover and create new ways to describe ourselves in our communities. It's an imperfect tool we, we use to express publicly what we feel inside. I appreciate the support of this house, its staff, and all members in supporting me to carve out a space that is comfortable and will support me in doing my best for Nova Scotians. Mm -hmm. In closing, I appreciate having the time to share the stories of a few Nova Scotians and consider what they mean collectively. I hope to have shared my inspiration and determination to do better for all Nova Scotians. Let us all have the bravery and spirit necessary to recognize the sticky issues in Nova Scotia that require our collective action. To our caucus staff, thanks for starting early, staying late, and showing me the ropes. Mm -hmm. To all of you in the house, I look forward to this session and the next and the next, where we've been given the responsibility of representing our constituents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.